48th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 48. And while you are turning there, I do want to let you know that uh, Anna and I and the kids, we missed you all. Uh, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. We missed being here at Gospel Light Baptist Church. And uh, after the service last Sunday morning, we were coming home and we got out the... Uh, the tablet here and we started tuning in to the live stream and we are watching everything and you know I heard you guys were winging it a little bit so get a little nervous there and uh, flying by the seat of your pants I thought hey wait up only I'm allowed to do that I thought <laughs> Pastor Dean and Pastor Hennies were uh, having a great time ministering to you and uh, the folks were just, my, my kids were looking and they were seeing everybody there on the screen and, and uh, just how uh, it brought smiles to our faces seeing you in person and, um, you know, just watching online. But it's a whole lot better being here. Amen. And so God has been good, giving us a place to serve and we're happy for that. And uh, trust that God will use all of us for the work that God has for us to do. All right. Um, I thank the Lord all the time for putting me in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in the South Southwest part of this county and opening doors that no man can shut uh, through the, the Promised Land camp, through Gospel Light Baptist Church, and uh, we've been able to just serve God uh, up to our eyeballs. <laughs> and uh, God is good in that way, and, and so many of you have just jumped right in and you're living for the Lord, and uh, you're such a blessing and encouragement to us. I hope we are the same to you. We're going to continue on our series uh, in the book of Isaiah this morning, and uh, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter number 48. Uh, for those that were here on Thursday, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit, and I covered Isaiah chapter number 47, and there we saw God's uh, pronouncement of judgment on the city of Babylon. And uh, here this morning, uh, we're going to read uh, this chapter, and we're going to see God once again addressing the nation of Israel. And so uh, I want to read here through, uh, let's see, the first five verses, and let's read responsively. I'll read the first verse, you read the next, and uh, let's read down uh, through the end of verse number five, and then we'll pray. Hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah which swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth, nor in righteousness. I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee. Lest thou shouldest say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image and my molten image hath commanded them. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Uh, I've entitled the message, Stiff-necked and Hard-Headed. It comes out of verse number four there where God says, I knew you were obstinate, and that your neck was an iron sinew. And that your brow was brass. This is God's outlook on the nation of Israel and the Jews of that day. And, uh, and really throughout their history that they had been. And I hope today as we look at this passage of scripture, we'll be uh, reminded of the glory of God and we'll be drawn towards how great God is. And I hope we'll be startled at how stiff-necked and hard-headed that the nation of Israel had been all throughout their history, generation after generation, almost as if the parents had shown the children how to be that way and, and they had shown their grandchildren uh, how to be that way and, and until God had to just uh, chastise them in such a severe way. And yet in all of that, I think we'll be brought back to uh, how good God is and what God is going to do and, and be warned because we are his people. We're not the nation of Israel, and I thank the Lord for that. We're the church of God. Uh, but there's some applications that we can draw from this chapter. But would you pray with me and for me as we begin this morning as we look at Isaiah chapter number 48. God, I do ask now for your help, Lord, and I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit of God. I pray that you would teach and guide us into all truth. Lord, if there's anybody here needing conviction, I pray the Holy Spirit would convict us 
them this morning. If somebody needs encouraged uh, or comforted, Lord, I pray that they would find that spiritual comfort uh, in the service today. God, I pray that you would do what I cannot. Speak to hearts. Lord, I prayed uh, throughout this week, I prayed this morning, God, that you would protect this church from me, Lord, from serving in the flesh. And God, I pray and I ask now that you would allow me to serve through you, God, and through your power and through your might. Meet with us, Lord, I pray. And warn us, Lord, we need to be challenged from your word. And I ask this now in Jesus' name, amen. So, so far here in the last few chapters of the book of Isaiah, we see that God is answering the challenge that he had put forth. Of course, he had gathered Israel and really the, all the nations of the world together and he had, had shown them, he had, 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 had put a challenge out there. Let's see who the real God is. And uh, in, in essence, that challenge was, hey, I can show you the future. I can tell you what's going to happen and I can bring it to pass. And, uh, and that should be, that ought to be evidence to you that I'm, the only true God, that I'm the one that you ought to worship, I'm the one you ought to be concerned about, I'm the one that you ought to be living to please, uh, and you ought not to be chasing after these idols, you ought not to be chasing after these other gods. Now Israel was running after those other gods because those other religions let them live according to the flesh. You know, you, you can serve and worship the other idol, idols because they were okay with you living the way you wanted to live. But uh, the, the problem with worshiping the one true God is that he actually had laid out a path and a way and he expected you to follow it. He wanted you to obey him because he has our best interest in mind, but they didn't believe that. And uh, so they had gone chasing after all this. And so uh, God had brought them together and he had told them, he had, he had foretold that because of their obstinance, because of their stubbornness, he was going to indeed punish them. He told them how. He said, I was going to give them over to Babylon. Uh, but then he reminded him, he said, look, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to allow you to return back. And he had named the name of the deliverer, Cyrus. We've read in the several passages about how Cyrus was going to be used by the hand of God. And God had some prophecies concerning Cyrus and the Persians were going to punish Babylon. And we looked at that in Isaiah 47, God's uh, uh, judgment on Babylon. God said, I'm going to destroy you. You went too far and you became proud. And, and, and all of this, by the way, comes to pass. And you can read about the fulfillment of these prophecies uh, in the book of Daniel and, and, and Ezekiel and other passages like that. So, so God is just... He's up to the challenge. Amen. And he's completing the task that he said that the one true God could complete. And he's laying it out. And now in Isaiah chapter number 48, what we have is God addressing the nation of Israel once again after giving them all of these prophecies about exactly how things were going to play out. And he's going to kind of summarize it all. He's going to address them as a nation one more time. And he's going to review different things uh, in, in, in this chapter. And so I see four things. I'm going to go through this chapter and divide it up into four different categories. Hopefully we'll get to all four of them this morning, but that's rather ambitious, right? <laughs> and, uh, and hopefully we'll be reminded of, of some truths and be warned of some other things as we look at these verses in this chapter. So first of all, I want you to notice that we see a lofty profession. We see a lofty profession. We see Israel uh, making some really high claims. Israel knew how to talk the talk. They could sound like the most spiritual people on the face of the earth. And when they talked, they made some very lofty claims. They claimed both pious religion and personal relationship with God. But God was not impressed with their lofty claims. God knew the true condition of their heart. In addressing Israel, God critiques seven claims that the Jews were making that were very lofty indeed. In fact, God critiques these things that they were going around. These are the children of Israel in that day and also during the Babylonian uh, captivity. God says, hey, they're going to talk spiritual. And I, when I was growing up, we had this little saying, your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Say that five times real fast. <laughs> Israel could talk the talk. Man, if you would have listened to them, you would have thought they were the most spiritual people 
on the planet. You would have thought, surely these people know God. These people walk with God. Kind of like the Pharisees in Christ's day, right? And the righteousness that they pretended to have to everybody. And, and this is what Israel was saying. And these were the claims, the lofty professions that they were making. First of all, we see they claim to be the house of Jacob. Uh, God says, hear ye this, O house of Jacob. They were descendants of the patriarchs. They had a family name. They had a spiritual heritage. They thought they were all that in a bag of chips uh, because they came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They also claimed the name of Israel. They claimed to be called by the name of Israel. Israel means prince of God. It was an honorable name. And along with that name that had been given to them by God uh, came uh, excellent covenants and a wonderful law that God had blessed them with and promises. So we read about these in Ephesians chapter number 2. They, they were privileged people. They were truly uh, 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 pr the apple of God's eye. That's what they were called in the Bible. Are you with me? And they were not bashful in claiming that. <laughs> they were like, we are Israel. That's, that's our name. They were proud of that, and they sounded spiritual by claiming that. They also said that they came forth out of the waters of Judah. This is where the name Jews come from. Uh, the, Judah was the royal tribe. It was the tribe that God had said uh, the king was going to come through, and, and Christ came from the line of Judah. They, had, uh, they, they knew that Judah was not only the royal tribe, but it was also the loyal tribe. You see, after the, the kingdom had been divided, the ten northern kingdoms, man, they had almost immediately strayed away from God. They, uh, their king Jeroboam had built up uh, alternative uh, temples and alternative uh, sacrifices. You read through that history. And the, the ten northern tribes didn't have one king. Not one king that followed the Lord. Not one king that did that which was right in the sight of God. In fact, those northern tribes, they were marked by kings like Ahab and Jezebel, but not so with Judah. No, they had stayed loyal to the Lord. They had been faithful. They had worshipped in the temple, and they had not forsaken uh, their traditions of their father. They were the Jews. That's what he's saying here. We're the royal tribe. We're the loyal tribe. Everybody else is forsaken, but we're still doing what's right. And boy, did it sound good on Sunday morning. Boy, did it sound good when everybody's rallying around each other in a morning worship service. But it's a different story on Tuesday. This is what happens. He says they make mention of the God of Israel. No doubt in their prayers and praises they ought to have made mention of God. As they went through their uh, religious uh, rituals and so forth, they knew how to say, well, it is Corbin. <laughs> it is dedicated to the Lord. We heard this morning about living sacrifices, and we need to be that. They, they talked the talk about being a living sacrifice. They talked about being dedicated to the Lord. They made mention of God all throughout their lives and their conversation but their hearts far from God we see that they swear by the name of the Lord it indicates that they made oaths of allegiance to God they made vows in his name they claimed covenants with God are you with me they were going through all of these all of the motions we see in verse 2 that they called themselves of the holy city. They identified with the holy city. While away captive in Babylon, they were dedicated to the remembrance of the holy city. They talked about it often. They tried to keep their identity uh, 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 as Jews, and they would pray facing the east, like, oh, that's where we are. And, and oftentimes those who are unholy <laughs> will be proud about their relation to that which is. And it is something that during the Babylonian captivity, many of them would pray towards Jerusalem. But when God used Cyrus to say, hey, you can go back to Jerusalem, none of them went. Only 42,000 returned. But boy, they could get down. Oh, the holy city. 
this Babylon. Oh, it's so terrible. We're not like the filth here in Babylon. We belong to the holy city. The Bible tells us in the Re book of Revelation, the holy city come down from Jerusalem. This is a true church, amen? And just because you have some kind of connection doesn't mean that you're true in your heart. The holy city. Seventhly, they stayed themselves upon the God of Israel. In Micah 3.11, the Bible says this, The heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. This is the nation of Israel. This is those who talk the talk. They said, wow, we're stayed upon Jehovah. Stayed upon Jehovah, that's us. We're the good guys. Everybody else, heretics. Everybody else, compromisers. Everybody else, unholy. But not us. We're the good guys. But God says there at the end of verse number one, but not in truth, nor in righteousness. You see, their walk didn't measure up to their talk. How they were living their lives didn't match up, match up to what they were saying with their mouths. In fact, when you took the truth and what God said in his law and you compared it to what they were doing, they didn't, they didn't line up. They were disobedient. They were rebellious. Everybody says, well, you know, you can't really trust that Bible. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, don't, don't, go, com, go, don't go comparing my life to there because, you know, we don't really know if that's from God or we really don't know if there's a bunch of errors in there. So, you know, I'm not to be held up against this. Well, isn't that convenient? Come on now. This is the reason why many in church don't want the preaching of God's word. They don't want to, the, 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 the righteous standard to be lifted up to show the light and to reveal uh, how we measure up. You with me? But God says in truth, they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the Bible says in righteousness. That's what God is after. God wants true righteousness. This is the lofty profession. I want you to notice secondly, though, in this passage. And by the way, let me just say this, and I got an illustration here, but it is amazing to me how people can live totally rebellious lives uh, uh, to the word of God and still think they're spiritual. Come on now. It is amazing to me how people can be so hard-hearted against God and so against God and so, uh, you know, uninterested in obedience to him and his word. And yet they think, I know God. The mafia boss, Bernardo Provenzano, when he was arrested, the police found him with five Bibles, with hundreds of his own margin comments and passages underlined. In his home were 91 sacred statues. Seventy-three of them were figurines of Christ. Each one of them bore the inscription, Jesus, I put my trust in you. He's a mafia boss. Another mafia boss, Michel Greco, had four books in his prison cell. Two of them were liturgical books, the Gospels, and a book entitled Pray, Pray. During his trial, when asked for an explanation for his many murders, he merely replied, I have an invaluable gift, inner peace. All right, I tell you, it, it's, it's a shame that people out there, they think, man, oh, I know God. They claim, oh, I know God. I'm okay. I'm right with God. They get angry at you if you try to share the gospel with them. I'm thinking, well, if, you, if you're saved and you like the gospel, why are you getting upset? Yeah. <laughs> Another believer is sharing the gospel with you. But, you know, this happens inside the church, too. I was talking with Brother Dave before the service. Uh, the people who seemed, you know, the least worried about the judgment of God on their life are the ones that ought to be the most concerned. 
I'm telling you, I don't want, I'm glad I'm eternally secure in Christ Jesus. Amen? Uh, but I will tell you that even the best of Christians that I have known that have had a soft heart towards God, there have been times and moments where they've even doubted their own salvation because of their fallenness and their sinfulness before God, and they've had to run back to the Scriptures. And then I know other Christians who are living wicked lives never doubted their salvation one time. And I think to myself, man, if anybody ought to get in the Word and stop Start checking out. Be anybody who ought to examine themselves whether or not they be in the faith. It seems to be the ones who are the least concerned about it. Well, I'm saved and I know it. Well, praise the Lord. I'm saved and I know it too. But are you living like it? Are you living like it? Does your life prove it to everybody else around you? Or do you have to tell them? Or they wouldn't know. Now, secondly, it brings us to the second part of this argument, and that's the lowly regression. <laughs> you see, they've been weighed in the balances, and they've been found wanting. They had lofty profession. They had a lofty profession. They were professing to know God. But in works, they were denying Him. This people draw near with me with their lips, God said, but their heart is far from me and they had sunk very low i say that because we see what god says by the way you know israel throughout its history is always lifted up in pride there's seven claims we find in isaiah 48 if you look at philippians chapter number three there are seven claims that paul says he says if anybody hath reason to trust in the flesh none more than me and he begins to he was like i'm a uh, you know i'm a pharisee and a hebrew of the hebrews and concerning the law you, you count them out there's seven claims in the flesh that paul, the apostle paul exact number we find here in isaiah chapter number 48 and you know what he was un, he, he was not unlike like many of the Pharisees of his day, we have all of these lofty claims. Praise the Lord. Paul said, I counted all them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him and the righteousness that he has, not my own righteousness. Now look at what God claims about them. Look at what God says about these people. There are six things that God declares about the true condition of, of the nation of Israel. I'll give them to you as quickly as I can. First of all, they were not, God says, you are not in truth and righteousness. In, at the end of verse number one, you claim to be spiritual, but you're hypocrites. You're whited sepulchers. Are you with me? He also says in verse four, thou art obstinate. That's the second thing God says about these people. The word obstinate means to stubbornly refuse to change one's opinion or chosen course of action despite attempts to persuade one to do so. Think about that. they just like, I'm not changing my mind. You can preach up there till you're blue in the face. You can quote verses to me. You can, you can try to help me. You can do whatever you want. I'm not changing. These are people who come to church week in and week out. The Holy Spirit of God never convicts them. They're never broken hearted. You'll never find them at the altar weeping, trying to get right with the Lord or, or just trying to, to cry out to Him for some spiritual need or for some help, uh, whether it be in their marriage or with their family or, or, or trying to lead their lost loved ones to the Lord. You'll never find them just, just uh, uh, compelled by God and uh, to come down and to kneel before Him. No, they're obstinate. Never once do they say, I was wrong. Never once do they Never once do they say, man, I'm so glad the Holy Spirit opened my eyes and revealed this to me. But week in and week out, Sunday after Sunday, Thursday after Thursday, they come in and they sit under the preaching of God's word and yet never come and feel any conviction. They're obstinate. He says thirdly about them that their neck is as iron. Their neck is as iron. Stiff-necked people, Right? They can't, they can't look up. <laughs> they can't look behind them. They're just walking around doing their own thing. They think they're okay. The Bible says this in the book of Proverbs, He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. And we need to take this to heart. You say, well, Pastor, I'm saved, praise the Lord. Hey, listen, you can be a stiff-necked saved person. You can be. 
And God's hand of judgment will come down on you if you're not careful. He says, fourthly, your brow is brass. <laughs> I was out street preaching yesterday. It was good to get out there. And all of a sudden, this colorful bus uh, started driving through downtown uh, uh, Lancaster. And it got my attention. It was all painted with all these different colors. And on the front, it said, the school of hard knocks. And, of course, Knox was K-N-O-X. I don't know if, bro if his brother James was trying to rebrand or what. <laughs> but I'm just saying, that does anybody really, really want to sign up for the school of hard knocks? I hope not. But, you know, if you're hard-headed, that's exactly what you're headed for. God just has to repeatedly, repeatedly come and try to correct you and fight you. The Bible says he resists the proud. Your brow is brass. I thank the Lord that God has not given me the ability to see the true condition of your heart. <laughs> I think to myself, if I wondered, if I looked out here today and the Lord just allowed those who are hard-headed, if he just allowed your brows to appear as brass right now, and I were to look out and see, I mean, it would probably change the nature of our relationship. <laughs> But God hasn't given to me that, and, and praise the Lord for it. I wouldn't be able to handle that. Neither could you if God gave you that ability. But make no mistake about it, God sees. God sees it just as clearly as if your head was shining with brass this morning, if you're hard-headed. He Don't be hard-headed with God. Don't be hard-hearted. Don't be stiff-necked. I'd rather err on the side of being humble. I'd rather err on the, the sacrifice of God, our broken spirit, the Bible says. I'd rather just say, Lord, I need you. Lord, teach me. Lord, guide me. Lord, I, the way of man is not in me. It's not in myself. God, your way is the way. I'd, I'd, I'd much rather want that to be my attitude and my heart's desire. He says in verse 8, fifthly, you've dealt treacherously with God. God says, you've dealt treacherously with me. These are, this is what God views when you come in and you make vows to God, but your heart's far from Him, okay? It, it's not good, friend. It's not good. God says, I've, I've, I've found your heart, and there's treason. There's treachery in it. And this was all throughout Israel's history. Deuteronomy 9, 7, 8, Remember and forget now how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt. Until you came unto this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. God said, man, from the very minute I delivered you from Egypt, you've been rebellious. And, and there's people here, praise the Lord, you're saved. But from the, you know, a, a minute after you got saved, you started fighting the Holy Spirit. You've been fighting God tooth and nail every step of the way. You're proud. It's not going to work out good for you in the end. And sixthly, he says, they had from the womb been called a transgressor. The end of verse number eight. No doubt indicating, as I just read, that from the very moment that, nation, that the nation of Israel had been born, as they walked through the, the, the Red Sea there, uh, they had been transgressors of God's law. From the moment God gave it, the law at Mount Sinai, they immediately began to break it. In fact, while Moses was on the mountain, getting the law of God. They were building a golden calf and they were dancing around it and they were worshiping at it. From the moment they had been in the womb, God said, you have been a transgressor. So much so that God said to Moses, get out of the way, I'm going to wipe these people out. I'm going to start a new nation with you. And you can read about how Moses prays and he intercedes. This, my friends, this is a lowly regression. Okay? They talk big, but they live small. They talked a holy talk, but they lived a wicked life when push came to shove. And that's, that's not good. Now, thirdly in this chapter, we'll see a loving confession. We see a loving confession. You see, despite all of this, God had still not given up on his people. And God had taken measures throughout Israel's history to try to prevent them from forsaking him. And then after they did and he had to chastise them, he also took measures to help restore Israel back to this place. This is what a loving God does. Whom the Lord loveth, the Bible says, 
he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son in whom he delighteth. And God had done that with Israel. We read in these verses uh, that God had taken uh, uh, extensive measures throughout Israel's history to prevent them from forsaking him and to help restore them uh, once they had. In particular, he had given them three blessings. He had given them divine prophecies, divine providences, and divine protectors. These were three blessings from God. And all of this was a demonstration of his great love for Israel. In verse number 3, he says this regarding divine prophecies. I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. Verse number 5, he says this. I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou shouldest say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten image hath commanded them. Listen, God says this to Israel, and this is something you need to learn as you study your Bible, that God had given Israel particular privilege from the very beginning, from the time that God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. God has always foretold Israel's future. He has always included. It's something that God has done for Israel. It's a special token of the covenant he made with him. He foretold to Abraham that his descendants would, would go to Egypt. He foretold that they would be enslaved. He foretold that they, he would then deliver them after 400 years, the exact amount of years. You, go fa you can fast forward to Moses. He, he foretold prophecies to Moses about Israel's history. He told them what was going to happen when they come into the land. He told them how they were going to forsake him and how he would use during the period of the judges all the different nations to correct them and so forth. And we could just, you can just go down throughout history, all the way through Israel's history. God has foretold them exactly what he was going to do in the future. Just like he's doing here in the book of Isaiah, how he's going to punish them with Babylon, how Cyrus and the Persians are going to allow them to return, how he's going to punish Babylon for what they did. You can go to the book of Daniel and God says, look, 70 weeks have been determined upon thy people. And this is what's going to happen leading all the way up until the moment that Messiah was cut off from Israel. Jesus told prophecies about what was going to happen to the nation of Israel immediately following his death. And by the way, the Bible gives us extensive prophecies about Israel's history during the great tribulation and how God is going to regather them and how they as a nation are going to still forsake him and trust the Antichrist. But a remnant is going to stay faithful and the Antichrist is going to persecute that remnant until all the nations of the world are gathered against them and they're trying to stomp them out. And then God's going to show up. Listen, from the very beginning until the very end, God continually gave Israel prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. It's a gift that God had given to them. That's what he's saying. Now, later on in this, in this passage, he says, not only did I do that from the beginning, but I'm doing a new things now. As if the excellent law that God had given to them was not enough. God had sent prophets along the way, men like Elijah and Elisha, men like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. These were prophets who came in along the way, and they had little micro-prophecies. They said, God's going to do this, and, they, and it happened. And it came to pass, and it came to pass, and they were just a continual reminder to Israel, like, hey, you're starting to stray here. Here's a message from God. Here's what's going to happen here. Here's what's going to happen there. Are you with me? This is incredible. All, this is what it amounts to. God had showed them hidden things that were beyond their knowledge. God was showing to them that he had all wisdom and knowledge and that they could put their trust and faith in him by revealing to them things that they could never learn by themselves. And by this, they knew not only that he was a true God, but that, that they were his, the apple of his eyes. See, Babylon, they had their astrologers. They had their soothsayers. They had their monthly prognosticators. And they were all there. And you know what they were saying to Babylon? They were saying to Babylon, you're going to be a lady forever. <laughs> they looked into the future and they saw nothing but good things for those who were serving false gods. 
They couldn't see that destruction was just right around the corner. One of the shortest empires of all the empires was Babylon. Okay, America's been a world power longer than Babylon was during this time. They couldn't even see it. But God had sent truth to his prophets with a true message to his people. The Babylon's days were numbered. He was going to bring them back in land. You see, you see all this playing a part here. Okay? But not only that, not only divine prophecies, but divine providences. God says, not only have I showed you hidden things that are beyond your knowledge, but I've also done amazing things that are beyond your power. I've given you water in a wilderness. I've, I've protected you. And his, Israel's history was marked by divine interventions from God like no other nation. I like studying American history, and I personally believe that God has intervened at times in, in, in U.S. history. I think there's circumstances that have no explanation other than God said, this is how it's going to be, but nothing like Israel. Don't, don't be mistaken, my friend. America is not the new Israel. Nothing like them. God preserving this people, despite the fact that they were hard-headed and rebellious against him. This is what's going through. This chapter, as we read, in verse 6 is when he talks about, Thou hast heard, see all this, and will not declare it. I have showed thee new things from this time, even hidden things, and thou dost not know them. They are created now and not from the beginning, even before the day when thou heardest them not, lest thou shouldest say, Behold, I knew them. It's interesting today in the world, they have their future tellers. During COVID, I remember I was talking with John Papadocillian and Pinsky hires these guys. And they tell them what the market's going to be like next year. And uh, they pay them big money because there's millions of dollars at stake. I mean, they've got to plan and they've got to purchase all these, you know, and so forth. And uh, I remember it because, it was, you know, 2020 was such a tricky year. <laughs> it's like, how in the world do you predict what the economy is going to be like when we have this thing happen that doesn't happen all the time? Intel employed a futurist named Brian David Johnson whose job was to determine what life would be like 10 to 15 years in the future. Johnson, as far as we know, it was the first futurist to work at Intel. He said this, and I quote, It takes around 10 to 15 years to design, build, and deploy a new chip. This is why Intel needed someone who can look 10 to 15 years into the future and tell them what the world they are designing for will be like. The work that I do is very pragmatic. I am judged on my ability to tell people what is coming so they can do something about it. Let's design futures that are designed for real people and the futures of real people. Hmm. Go take a look, you know, get a load of that. <laughs> they, they hire people who don't really know the future to prognosticate the future, and then they depend on these people. And yet we have the God of heaven who's told us exactly what truth is and what's going to happen. And yet God's people don't rest on it and they don't act accordingly. This was Israel. In verses 14 and 15, we see the divine protector. In this reference, it's reference to uh, Cyrus. He says, All ye assemble yourselves in here, which among them hath declared these things. The Lord hath loved him. He will do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arms shall be on the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken, yea, I have called him, I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. Cyrus, here's a picture, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. God had chosen Cyrus, the shepherd king, to be his instrument of deliverance and restoration. By God's strength and power, Cyrus would defeat Babylon and bring God's people back into the land of promise. He pictures Christ and that he did the pleasure of the Lord. That was said about Jesus. In fact, later on in the prophecy of Isaiah, he would say that, that the word would go forth and would accomplish all of his pleasure. 
He, he's a type of Christ and that God had called him to this ministry. This was not something he had taken upon himself. God had sent him from a far country. This is also another uh, uh, four type, a, a shadow, if you would, of the Lord Jesus Christ coming from heaven down to this earth. And God had made his way prosperous. That brings me then to the fourth and final section of this chapter. And that is a living commission. We've heard of the Great Commission, right? God's command in light of all of this truth. And in verses 16 down to the end of the chapter, we find God's summary of how Israel ought to behave in light of everything that He had just given. In light of all of this truth, in light of the prophecies, in light of the uh, 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 providences, and in light of the uh, protection that God would send through Cyrus and allowing them to come back, God says, here's what I expect of you. God does not deal with doubt. He doesn't deal with nebulous. God gives you it plainly right there in the scriptures. Amen? Let's look at this briefly and then we'll conclude this morning. What is it that God says that he desires from Israel? Begin in verse 16. He says, Come ye near unto me. Hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from that time that it was. There am I, and now the Lord God and His Spirit hath sent me. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Now, first command is, is, he says, I want you to come. I want you to come near to the Lord. Draw nigh to me with your heart. Come and hear. Amen. Come and hear. That's what God says. In verse 14, he had said, assemble yourselves together. Now, God had given Israel different times out of the year where all the men of God were supposed to be in Jerusalem. They were supposed to be where God told them to be. Why? So they could be hear the word of God and they could be reminded about what God had done for them. And all throughout Israel's history, they forsook, they forsook the Passover. They forsook the keeping of those, those feasts and, and, and those times when they were supposed to be gathered together, when they were supposed to be listening to the word of God and being reminded for it. Maybe it was in, too inconvenient. Maybe they were too busy building their farms and they felt like, man, I can't obey God and I can't obey his word and I can't be where God wants me to be because I've got to take care of my family. I've got to pay the bills or I've got to do this or that. Whatever excuse they had used in their mind, in forsaking uh, the assembly that God had called them out to. And now God is saying, hey, look, in light of all of what I'm going to do, in the light of the fact that you're going to be chastised, and then I'm going to bring you back and all of this, I want you to come, assemble yourselves together, keep my law, be where I tell you to be, obey me. When you come together, you will hear the word of God as the call to worship so amply brought out this morning. You're going to hear God's word being preached. You're going to be challenged and edified to live the way that God says. In verse number uh, 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 17, he says, when you draw near, not only will God, but he says the Holy Spirit of God will teach you how to profit. Boy, doesn't that get you excited? I thought Brother David's going to jump out of his chair, amen? We all ought to jump out of our chair. God says when you come and you assemble, then the Holy Spirit of God will take the word of God and he'll teach you how to profit. He'll teach you how to be successful. Man, the world's out there and they want to tell you how to live their life. They want to define success for you. They want to pound your mind and your brain with everything that you need to, to do or, or to be in order to feel good about yourself. But God says, forget that. Come to church, come to my word, come where you're going to hear, and then my Holy Spirit is going to teach you how to profit. Wow, isn't that good? Isn't that good? You know what he says? He says the Holy Spirit of God is also going to teach you in the way that thou shouldest go. Boy, I can preach on this. Immediately my mind went to that verse in Proverbs where the Bible says train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I wanted you to know this, that by bringing your family to church, and not just church, it's coming to the assembly and the believers and making God the center of your heart and the center of your life. But by doing that, God the Holy Spirit is going to teach you in the way that you ought to go. 
The problem and the reason why generation after generation after generation in the nation of Israel had gone back to idolatry was because they had learned that from parents who, didn't, who, who only served God when it was convenient, who thought it was more important to be involved in everything else except being where God wanted them to be. And they taught them a way that those children should go and those children depart from it. And they never do, friends. They never do. Now, you can talk Christianese all you want, and you can claim to be spiritual, and you can say, woo, we just know Jesus, and you can lift your hands, and I lift my hands in service, but you can do all that spiritual stuff. But if you teach your children through the way you live your life that God is not the most important thing in your life, then those kids are going to go the way that you trained them. And there's no exceptions. There's no, like, like, I can't say otherwise. I mean that. I'm for you. I get outside this pulpit. I'm your friend. I'm no different than you. I got my own struggles. I'm trying to lead my own family. I stand behind this pulpit, and I preach the word of God. One of the hardest things is trying to look at parents who want me to say, yeah, God's okay with that. Oh, yeah, your kids are going to be okay when they're not. Anybody that tells you so is a compromiser and a liar because God's truth stands forever. Be where you're supposed to be. Hear what you're supposed to hear and let the Holy Spirit teach you the way you're supposed to go. Things will turn out a lot better for you than they did for the nation of Israel. Amen? So God says come together. Look at, look at what else he says. One other thing. He says in verse number 20, Go ye forth of Babylon. Flee ye from the Chaldeans. With a voice of singing declare ye. Tell this, utter it even to the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. And they thirsted not when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He clave the rock also and the waters gushed out. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. You know, the second command that God gave to the children of Israel in this living commission, come out from among them and be ye separate. Get out of Babylon! Isn't that easy? He said, hey, look, my will's not for you to be living in the world. My will for you is not to be lusting after the world. My, 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 my will for you is not for you to be loving the world. My will for you is to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. He says, hey, get out, disassociate yourself from these wicked places. Amen? Now, this is rocket science, folks. And I know sometimes I feel like, man, am I just up here stating the obvious? <laughs> But you would be surprised at how difficult it can be sometimes for God's people to just separate from wickedness. There's nothing good in there for you. God's delivered you from it, praise the Lord. Through the power of his Holy Spirit, you do not have to live under sin anymore. So get away from it. You know how many times in the New Testament we have this command to flee, flee. He says right here, Flee, not only should we disassociate from wicked places like Babylon, there's places you ought not to go as a believer. Come on now, because they're, it's Babylon. What are you doing? You got no business being there. I don't, I don't go to the bars. I don't go to the strip clubs. I don't go to the movie theater where they promote the bars and the strip clubs. I don't go places that, that are characterized by Babylon. And I don't think I'm proud because of that. I just say, look, I belong to the king. I serve a different savior. I want to be in the holy places. Disassociate yourself from wicked places. But God also says this, flee the Chaldeans. That's not a place, friend. That's people. He says, separate from wicked people. Now, I hope 
that you wouldn't let somebody sit in your living room and blaspheme God and use dirty language and, 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 and you wouldn't bring some uh, a filthy woman into your house half clothed or half naked and put them in front of your children. I hope you would never do that, but you'll turn on the TV and you'll let all that stuff play in the center of your home. And then you get upset at the man of God when your life isn't what you thought it was going to be. As if the man of God is causing up this pro all these problems. Just let us go. Hey, we're going to go down to that other church where, you know, they'll never say anything like I just said. We'll go there and that way we can go to as many movies as we want and we can do whatever we want and we can, we can live however we want to live and nobody will say anything to us. And the minute somebody actually says, man, you know, maybe God is chastising you. Oh, I don't know why. I don't know why this happened to my grandkids. Why'd they run off with some bozo? Why do we got children out of wedlock? Why are we addicted to drugs? Why all of this stuff? Maybe because you stayed in Babylon too long. When you should have got out. Maybe because you didn't separate from people say, yeah, but I didn't want to make them mad. You're going to lose your kids. You're going to lose your church. Look, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I want you to be loved by everybody. <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up. I don't know what the Holy Spirit has. I don't, want, I don't want your family to hate you. I don't. But if your family is filled with Babylon, you need to get your family away. Yeah. All right? You just got to. Do it in a loving way. Do it as kind as you can. If you, if you absolutely have to try to have some association, try to be, make it on your terms. Okay? so that you can structure the environment and make sure that there's no wickedness that's going to be present, take a stand because it's not worth losing your family over. It's not worth inviting the judgment of God into your life. Find, find a different TV show or turn it off altogether and go listen to books on tape or do whatever. I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to say the Holy Spirit of God will lead you but you got to disassociate from wicked places. And you got to disengage from wicked people. That's what God says. That's what my desire is. It's always been for Israel to be blessed beyond measure. I think one of the saddest verses in the Bible is verse number 18 and 19. When God laments. This is God lamenting. And God says, oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments. Then you would have had peace like a river. Oh, my will for Israel had been that they had just been blessed beyond measure, that they would have peace like a river, that they would have waves of righteousness, that their families would have grown and been prosperous as, as the number of the sand of the sea, like he had told Abraham. That's what God wanted for them. It's not what they experienced because they were stiff-necked and they were hard-headed. God laments here and says, man, that's... And he ends, and I'm going to preach a message on Thursday on just that last verse of this chapter by reminding him, there is no peace, saith God, to the wicked. As I close this message, with what I'm going to preach on Thursday, you know all those people, those family members, you're like, oh... I don't want to upset the boat. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want conflict there. I think I'll just get peace if I accept their sin. There'll be peace in our house. They won't, they'll like me. God says, there is no peace. No peace. You can fool yourself. Pastors are fooling themselves if they think that I don't want to rock the boat in the church. I'm just going to put up with everybody's sin. Because then we can just, you know, have a big crowd and it'll be really great. And, you know, we won't have any conflict in the church. And everybody will like me because I didn't say anything controversial. They're fooling themselves. Because God says there is no peace to the wicked. Every husband, 
who's afraid of the fit that his wife might throw if he puts his foot down and says, for as for me and my house, we're going to live, the Lord, we're going to live for the Lord. He thinks he's going to keep the peace in the house. If he'll just compromise, let me tell you something, there is no peace. Every parent who thinks, man, if I just waffle a little bit, if I'm just more accepting of my child's rebellion, and then they'll like me, and everybody okay with it, and I'll just, you know, I'll just, it's my babies, and so, you know, I, you know, I don't care. I, I know I used to believe that that was sin, but I'm going to change my beliefs now so that everybody get along in the family. There is no peace. That's what God says. That's what happened to Israel. So let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for... Opportunity to preach your word, God, to your people. I thank you for the tenderness of their heart, Lord. I pray that anything that I said today, this morning, would only be to help. Lord, they don't have to live their life like me. They need to, to be more like Jesus. They need the Holy Spirit of God, all of us, myself included. Lord, I don't know what it is. Sometimes we can get in the flesh in our desire to separate from things that defile. I know that, God. Help us not to be that way. But, Lord, I do know that your Holy Spirit of God wants to take us out of Babylon, wants to take us to a place of sanctification and righteousness and holiness because it's there that we find peace like a river. It's there that waves of righteousness will fill our lives. It's there, Lord, that our families will grow and prosper. And so I pray that you would just deal with your people this morning. Help us not to be like Israel. Help us not to continually teach the generation after us that it's okay to live for self and things and to live for Babylon. Please, God, I pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed, we have an invitation. Don't be a stiff-necked, hard-headed Christian. God will just have to repeatedly chastise you until there comes a point when he'll just take you home. Mom, Dad, You need to let the Holy Spirit of God teach your family in the way that it should go so that your children will not depart. Seems like parents today think that there's a better way or there's some new technology or whatever it might be that'll help their kids need the Holy Spirit of God a real relationship with him oh